Because of the five aggregates, the common belief in our world is that there's some sort of independent real self. Each and every one of us have an independent real self, an isolated separate sense of self. And uh, the Buddha challenged this view you know, 2,500 years ago, and we're still challenging it to this day, and we haven't really bore the fruit of the Buddha's teachings, you know. I had a conversation between two scholars and they were saying that in the, their study and statistically over 90% of the world population think very much like a westernized mm, way mm, mm. so this independent self yep. no matter you're Asian or not nowadays it's over mm. 90% which is a very very dominant number yeah of course yeah. which is a, I think it's actually and it's concerning a little bit because mm. the cognitive style of the east and of places like south america and africa are different to european people right so it's very concerning not just european people i should say like north american and australian but like the origins of western thought is in europe obviously and so to have that idea of especially of individualism in places such as korea mm -hmm. well the thing is that the cognitive style is still holistic but the way of thinking is transferred over to Yes. To individualism and this idea that everyone's a separate sense of self. Hence, there can be a lot of confusion within, so if, as you know, because you, you are Korean you've, and we've lived, mm -hmm. you're from there and we've mm -hmm. lived there and mm -hmm. you see the way people <clears throat> can be there. And there's a friction between the two cognitive styles. Like they have this rich heritage and culture bumping up against this uh, <laughs> westernized, westernized uh, individualistic yes. and then they're off TikTok and then, you know, so forth and so on. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so the idea is that there is this independent sense of self with the substantial essence of a persona, right? So it's an independent entity. Actually, all the Eastern spiritual traditions, they go into depth to debunk this illusion. And we kind of come to this illusion because, you know, we live through the aggregates, right? And then we have this experience, a subjective experience of being an, a, a conscious agent every yes. day. So once we have this experience of being a conscious agent, we start to believe then that we are this permanent soul or self that is going to live on. And, you know, we're going to, after death, we're going to be playing pool with Gandhi and George Washington and you know Martin Luther King and we're going to be sipping tea and stuff like this so we have all of these illusions that come from the independent sense of self because yes. see you then are still going to live on after your life you as yourself yes. I mean mm. Guyang's going to be chilling with mm. you're going to be chilling with your grandma and your great grandma and this is all what's going to happen after your death and yes. so forth and so on that's uh, that's common knowledge, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how we think of death and things like that as a uh, my life and yes. my life after death and yeah. things like that. And so Buddha is challenged in this, the idea of my life. Yes, this is my life. Yeah. Well, let's unpack that. Yeah, because are you a product of just the five aggregates? Mm. Because the Buddhist belief that the self is is only the constituents of the five aggregates. Mm. So that's what he wants to challenge. So basically the five aggregates develop this sense of self because they are built from a series of dependently arisen circumstances, right? Or events. Yes. So that's how the five aggregates develop the sense of self. So we have the five aggregates as a human and we go through life and we experience the events, as you were mentioning too, uh, about the accumulative sense of self. Mm -hmm. And then this creates this sense of persona. Yes. But we exclude that they're all dependently arisen set of events and circumstances. Hundred mm. percent. That build your, your sense of self. That's why a lot of people you know, they they throw off that phrase very uh, casually, you are your environment. Mm. And from a Buddhist perspective, there's a lot of truth to that. Mm. You are your environment. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that when you change your environment, and that environment becomes part of you as well. Exactly, mm. exactly. And that's why when sometimes when you also change your environment, you can feel uncomfortable in a new environment because you're used to the circumstances in the other environment. You don't have that variation that Lao Tzu was talking about where you can just be like, Move through ride the like the wind. Mm. Yes. 
you know, you, mm. you, you can't ride like the wind. So mm. people have to realize that the self does exist in Buddhism, but it has the aggregates. Yes. So it's not a nihilistic tradition. It's not like, oh, it's not a fatalistic thing where, oh, what, what, we, we just don't exist. Yes. Like, no, you exist yes. to a certain degree. Yes. But not as firmly and permanently as you think. Yes. Again, the five aggregates constitutes the sense of self here. Mm. And that five aggregates, once you unpacked what they are, and again, all the, these five aggregates are purely response or the reaction of a certain situation or events. Yep. So that reaction creates the idea of who you are. Yes. It, yeah, so that, yeah, again, the feeling, form, perception, and all these things that creates and sensations, the sensations create the thoughts, and the thoughts create this thought after thoughts. And so that is becoming, building the sense of that independent self. Mm. So the independent self is actually not independent at all. Then no. <laughs> you purely depend on the, mm. that very situation or... Mm. events well your sense of self is dependent your actual nature is shunyata your self exists because of you know the causes and conditions that, that actually inform your existence right yes so everything you've experienced has built this sense of persona mm -hmm. and that's what you've accumulated through your whole life and then you say then you say i mm -hmm. but then you think back and you think well what about i at 19 can, mm. can I look at that I at 19 mm. and I now is 41 and are we the same mm. person? Completely different, mm. completely different. And, you know, psychologists talk about this a lot and this and that where even that it gets to the stage where we actually change day to day. Mm. And a lot of people actually don't want to believe that. Mm -hmm. And that's why there's a lot of research where people try to hold on to, say, their 18th sense of self. And when they're 60, there's actually... Psychologists say there's actually been a lot of psychological damage from trying to hold on to like a younger version of yourself because in, in some sense, and this actually supports the five aggregates, mm. you haven't actually experienced life. Mm. You're holding on to a set of beliefs and mm. probably where you were from, from a long, long time ago, but then you move to Trinidad and Tobago, then you move to, you move to <laughs> France and then Kenya, and then you're still supposed to be this guy from Queensland in Australia. I mean, mm. I mean, you, that means you would have went through your life like this and didn't see anything, yeah. didn't experience anything, yeah. right? Yeah. Again, it's a, some reason people want to hold on to that 19-year-old uh, point of view mm. to the world, mm. right? Mm. And uh, as if people often think that changing your perception towards the world is like a somewhat negative mm. thing, mm. so that you just try to re remain at that uh, perception as a 19-year-old and you keep that perception until you're 60. Mm -mm. So you must have gone through a lot in life for mm. like, let, yeah, if they're 40 years' time, it's a long time, mm. right? Mm. So... Natural progression, you're supposed to change. Yeah, like 100%. other than 19 year old, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah. But if you were to have still have the same perception and cling on to that uh, same perception as a 19 year old when you're 60, then yeah, definitely there's some sort of psychological problem going. It has to be right. Yeah. Right? Well, what's common in most cultures when you and I've, I've witnessed this in many different cultures, and you and I are pretty well-traveled, is people will often say, ah, he or she hasn't changed, and it's great. <laughs> hasn't changed. And it's like, why is that great? I don't understand why that's great. And first of all, it's not a real accurate statement because people say that usually because they may still like certain things. Mm. You, know, you know what I mean? They may still like a certain sporting team, or they may still act maybe a certain way. But in, in reality, they've changed actually quite substantially from, you know, in a, in a decade, for example. And in that situation, whoever, uh, the person who were praising the other person in that way, him or herself is resisting change. They're resisting change themselves, yeah. That's why they think being um, growing up and, and being more mature and having uh, a change in life is something like not very good. Mm. That's how they see it, so that they think not changing 
Mm, it's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because change frightens people. Mm. Change, and, and first of all, because change starts to tear mm. down the artifice of your own persona. See, when you start to change, and you, if you're a contemplative person and you think deeply, you, you start to realize that may, maybe who I am is not really actually who I am. Mm. You know, I'm holding on to this sense of self, yes. but change is changing me, yes. so to speak. Yes. Because you are part of the dependently arisen world your sense of self is part of the world. Mm-hmm.